I don't think it is always necessary to justify to people why they should listen to China so that my identity as a Chinese person feels safe. I also realized something else while I was making those videos. Ah, this is going to be a million dollar idea, I just knew it. <laughs> and the fact that I didn't apply this principle is the biggest and the most costly mistake I've made. Hiya! <laughs> I've been making videos about Chinese politics for more than a year now. I know for many China watchers, Xinjiang has been a bit of a hard bone to chew. I could jump into a conclusion and think that China is indeed killing cultural diversity and that is just cruel, short-sighted and wrong. And in this year, I have changed my mind about things. I have made some big mistakes, but I also received a lot of clarity when it comes to controversy. In this video, we'll be talking about all of these things. Oh, by the way, if you're new here, my name is Siming, I'm Chinese, and I make videos sharing my views on China's affairs and stuff. I also know that we want to hang out more often, so I'll be taking you on a hike with me where we will be checking out a giant Guanyin statue on top of a mountain. So, let's go. People are having Nongjia Fan meals. Nongjia Fan meals? Fama? Fama's meal. Chinglish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, maybe. That, that maybe, yeah. Four faces, four human. This is a god made of four human bodies. And um, this is called four faced god. And this is um, a kind of god with, that is made of four human bodies. And you just sort of. Um, You see, these are all the gods we worship. This is what diversity means for us. All right, let's get some, get some rest. First things first, unlike many other creators, I didn't start it off with the idea of making videos to bridge cultural gap. If you have watched my earlier videos, you know that I was making content around language learning and personal development. And it was actually you guys that helped me find my niche. It was also great timing. I had a huge identity crisis after moving back to China. When you have lived in a world where you not only have Chinese friends and teachers, but also British friends and American friends and teachers, you would have received cultural influence that can feel very jarring in your body. And that really tore me apart because I had such a hard time figuring out who I was. I didn't know what I believed. I didn't know what my authentic voice was. And where do I stand in between these two ideologically, culturally, racially different worlds, you know? That is to say, I make videos to look for clarity, to be an observer and to understand the thought process of a culture that I thought I knew. And the goal was always to navigate difficult realities and to be non-judgmental. Because I am a type of person that truly, truly believes in the middle ground. I truly, truly do believe that there is a happy medium where two contradictory narratives can both be the truth at the same time. But I also believe that it's only possible if people can articulate how their experience has helped shape that narrative. This is the view that we are looking at now. We are probably at the waist of the mountain and we're not very far away from the Guanyin. Halfway through, I realized I began to make some serious mistakes. One example is the Xinjiang video. So yes, China's policy in Xinjiang is not a mere issue of re-education, as he likes to put it. The essence is still about using politics to deal with what China regards as its enemies. In the video, my goal was to make sense of what has been reported on this topic. I highlighted the historical and the philosophical roots of the two different arguments from China and the Uyghur diaspora. 
I also discussed how we can make sense of the thought process of China's political system by drawing on some of its ideologies. But I didn't address the reality of what was actually happening, which is what people most wanted to know. In a comment session, a viewer kindly pointed out this problem as well as my research method. And it turned out to be one of the best criticisms I've ever received. And the question to think about is this. When you're investigating a complicated, controversial subject, how do you make sure that the knowledge that you produce represents the closest version to the reality. Thing is, you won't be able to find the answers in reports that lead to the most extreme possibilities. So basically, you could take the, the Chinese media and the Western media and their reports off the table. However, you also won't be able to find all the answers in the existing academic literature. In hindsight, a more effective and honest approach would have been surveying Uyghur locals, talking to them, talking to as many of them as possible about their experience while keeping the answers anonymous. Because it is only when you have a large quantity of a wide range data that you can be confident enough to draw a credible conclusion. It will also be really helpful if you can talk to religious figures and academics who support the policy and those who don't, you know, to make sense of it. You know, these are just some of the examples. How doable is this process is you know, another issue of its own. But I knew this stuff about methodology. Like I was trained to do this. And the fact that I didn't apply this principle is the biggest and the most costly mistake I've made. In the future, I will probably keep this in the forefront of my mind whenever I think about difficult topics like this. to climb the stairs to see the mountain oh i see the guanyin now oh that's how it looks okay the guanyin statue is literally just behind my head um are you ready to see it yeah i don't think so <laughs> no i'm just kidding i wouldn't do that to you here we go So what we're going to do next is that we're going to climb those stairs to see the grand lady at the top, which is where we'll be ending our little hike today. I also realized something else while I was making those videos. Ah, this is going to be a million dollar idea, I just knew it. <laughs> the essence of the good and bad China debate is identity politics. You're probably familiar with the dynamic between liberals and conservatives. It is kind of like a war between people who, for example, advocate for gender neutral bathrooms and people who don't even think abortion should be legal. Between people who parade for the gay pride and people who secretly told their friends that it was a stupid idea. You catch my drift. In short, identity politics is about people with different race and language and culture fighting for recognition of their values and beliefs. And the China debate is identity politics playing out on an international level. Over the last decade, China is going through a massive transformation and the entire world is celebrating it. But what people didn't see coming is when you grow, your identity grows. For China, it is evolving from a follower to an aspiring world leader. It is identifying itself as acting on behalf of the world, as the beacon of new possibilities. But not just yet. An identity is not an identity unless it is acknowledged by other members of the society. Any Americans who have received a basic civic education would perceive the US as the most powerful country in the world. It represents the entire Western civilization, democracy itself, and even the international community. If China's transition really happens, it is going to create a huge wave of identity crisis for America. In which case, people will have to recognize that being American is no longer what it used to mean. That is really disconcerting. Everything you see on the media, people making defamatory comments and strident analysis about each other. They're operating like a little cock in the entire identity politics machine. Sounds totally sad, but 
perfectly human. We know who we are only when we know who we are not, and often only when we know who we are against. Once I realized that, it changed everything I do. But she is huge. So my first reaction after realizing that, I let go, you know, I let go real quick. I think I've grown to a phase where I no longer feel encumbered by the desire for everyone to agree with me. I don't think it is always necessary to justify to people why they should listen to China so that my identity as a Chinese person feels safe. This is for the Chinese gang out there. So if you're looking for some kind of closure, this is the closure for you. Your priority is to learn as much as you can about this country and to grow as a person. You certainly do not need to be a China apologist to own your identity as a Chinese. By the way, I'm only in my 20s. I am always, always more interested in learning and listening than telling people what they should believe. I actually don't want to be so certain about what I already know so I can still be challenged and grow into new perspectives. I'm here on this earth to evolve and change. That is the biggest lesson I've learned in the previous year. In this coming year, I'm looking to experiment more on this channel. There are endless possibilities to explore China. I will be continuing on this journey and share with you what I learned. But I didn't address the reality of what was actually happening. I've been making videos about Chinese politics for more than a year now. And during this year, I've made a lot of mistakes. 